years ago, I received a comment on one of my Ben 10 reviews that alerted me to the existence of an animated series known as Teen Titans Go. A year later, I planned to do a review of said show, but within a few days, I realized the task was too daunting and I shelved the review indefinitely. Not because the show was unreviewable, but rather, the show was lost underneath a seemingly endless torrent of hatred spilling in from all sides of the internet. Fast forward to today, and I finally announced that I began to watch Teen Titans Go on my Twitter account, following a peek in curiosity after the theatrical movie Teen Titans Go to the Movies, released in July 2018. Having now experienced all of what the show has to offer, and seeing firsthand the reactions of those who have witnessed the show, I pose this question to all. Why exactly is Teen Titans Go so hated in the cartoon community? That's what I intend to explore in this video today. For a bit of background, Teen Titans Go, developed by Michael Jelinek and Aaron Horvath, began airing on Cartoon Network in April 2013, and is currently in the middle of its fifth season as of the uploading of this video. The show is an adaptation of the DC comic book characters The Teen Titans, created by Bob Haney and Bruno Premiani in 1964, and subsequently an unrelated spin-off to Cartoon Network's 2003 animated series Teen Titans. Since Teen Titans Go! began airing, the response from critics, DC fans, and fans of the original show have been largely negative, with most touting its immature humor, poor animation quality, and lack of emotional depth in the characters and action sequences as their major critiques, especially in comparison to the original 2003 Teen Titans series. When analyzing the comedic styling the series go for, it appears to be a six-part combination of subversion of expectations, deadpan humor, toilet humor, slapstick humor, self-referential humor, and a general parodic cynicism. For example, one episode may involve learning about the importance of reading and how reading is actually bad for you, thereby subverting the moralistic archetype of kids' cartoons. Going through what the series has to offer, one might say that there isn't really much to speak of beyond the comedy itself. However, the main characters, Robin, Starfire, Beast Boy, Raven, and Cyborg, each boast their own well-defined personality, meant to contrast with one another in any situation. Taking all these points together, it might be reasonable to ask, what's the big deal? Truthfully, the humor can be likened to a blend of sources, such as SpongeBob SquarePants, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, and The Three Stooges. There is one sticking point that makes Teen Titans Go in a bit of a unique situation, however, and that is that this wholly comedic series was preceded by a series starring the same characters with the same voice actors that was not a pure comedy. Therefore, regardless of its lack of continuity, this series is inexorably linked to its predecessor, which is often touted as being a far superior show. In the interest of objectivism, I did not watch the original series before making this video, because my interest is in getting to the root of the purported issues with Teen Titans Go. Something that can be attributed not to nostalgia or a difference of opinion, but to a simple, quantifiable observation. And I believe I have found the true root of the issues with this series, the so-called fatal flaw of Teen Titans Go, around which all the other critiques gravitate. When understanding the backlash against this series, and the creator's own backlash to said backlash, it's important to take a step back and observe the situation rationally. Seriously, I actually really hate Teen Titans Go. It's my least favorite show on Cartoon Network area. Taking into account the types of humor the show utilizes, and its comparison to similar comedic shows, there appears to be nothing fundamentally wrong with what the show offers. The execution may not be perfect by any means, and doesn't appeal to everyone's sensibilities. But the series does understand concepts such as comedic timing, pacing, tone, and a proper subversion of expectations through the use of dialogue, sound effects, and physical comedy. To put it simply, this series has a basic understanding of comedy and when to apply it. So what, then, is the issue? If the fatal flaw isn't its fundamentals, then where does the fatal flaw come from? Well, I posit that the fatal flaw that crippled this show before it even began is its frame of reference. To understand what I mean by this series' fatal flaw being its frame of reference, we need to look at another show that utilizes every single one of the same comedic styles mentioned earlier, Drawn Together. Drawn Together is an adult animated reality series from 2004 about eight parodies of cartoon characters from all around the animated universe living together in one house. 
The characters in that show are depicted as getting into ridiculous and shocking situations that are completely removed from what you'd expect of their true incarnations. For example, Captain Hero, a parody of Superman, uses a woman as a human shield and gets her killed as a result. He then hides her dead body and presumably has sex with and cannibalizes her corpse off-screen. This situation is humorous because of not only the subversion of expectations and the shock humor, but also the subversion of character. We, as the viewer, understand that the real Superman would never commit such heinous acts, making the situation funny by way of parodic expression, i.e. the explicit fact that it isn't Superman is what makes it amusing. Now, imagine if you take the parodied depictions of established characters from Drawn Together and instead make it like this. Now you've got SpongeBob SquarePants throwing his penis tied to a cinder block over a balcony, Pikachu mercilessly killing people, and Princess Ariel spouting horribly racist rhetoric. Suddenly, it becomes a lot less funny due to the references we make and understand about those characters. We understand that Link from The Legend of Zelda would never be officially depicted having anal sex with another man, or Betty Boop wouldn't have a cartoon made about her where she shoves an umbrella up her vagina. If you can imagine a whole cartoon made where earnest, official depictions of these established characters you know and understand participate in such, for lack of a better word, out-of-character behavior, there's a good chance you'd automatically be negative towards it. Some people might say it's taking the characters down a peg, but it doesn't matter. Once you can rightfully say that the characters wouldn't do that, the show is cast into a negative light before it even begins. That frame of reference will never go away. You might be asking at this point why a parody of that nature would be considered inappropriate when there exist thousands upon thousands of parodies on the internet of established characters doing out-of-character things that people enjoy. Well, I believe the reason those are regarded with praise is simply endorsement, or more, the lack thereof. Parodies of that nature are generally done by fans, with either a tongue-in-cheek manner stemming from a place of affection or familiarity, or with a desire to highlight that specific character or character's mannerisms in an amusing way. The fact that these parodies are unofficial and unendorsed lend them an air of comedic detachment, as in the fans decided to make them do and say these things, not the creators. If the creators of those characters put them into those same out-of-character positions or situations, it would most likely be met far less warmly, because it comes with a tacit acceptance of that behavior, an official stamp of approval, you might say, and to many, that ruins the joke. Of course, it all comes down to context and intent, but that's merely the conclusion I've come to in that regard. Going back to Teen Titans Go, you might now see where the fatal flaw can be found. In truth, the core concept itself is not flawed at all. A team of five inept superheroes living together, making their lives difficult for one another. There's nothing wrong with that, really, so where is it then? In truth, the fatal flaw isn't conceptual or fundamental, it's representational. Imagine if you had the exact same series about inept superheroes living their daily lives, but instead of making it about the established and understood characters from the Teen Titans, you instead made it about their equivocal stand-ins. Suddenly, the idea of a high-strung, powerless leader with control issues becomes a lot more humorous when you strip away his established identity as Robin, and instead make him the idea of a Robin-like character, a caricature of the Robin archetype, if you will. Instead of saying that character Robin wouldn't do that, you'd see it more as, yes, that would be funny if Robin did that, or Robin totally does that, that's funny. The frame of reference can only be utilized fully when that reference is indirect. Otherwise, the actions performed by said established characters are inappropriate for themselves. This is why I generally regard the show itself as an overall unfortunate clashing of ideas. Its approach to parody is biting self-awareness, almost too much so at times, but it can't be a parody of the characters and their behavior if the characters are the actual characters. You can't say Raven would totally do that because it's the actual Raven currently doing that. There's only so far an ironic or parodic depiction can go before it loses its intent and just becomes a depiction of that character doing that thing. Without a strong sense of association or reference, much more humor can be taken out of the series because it just comes off as a bunch of inept superheroes doing humorous things, allowing the core concept, execution, and comedic fundamentals to stand on their own merits. Hence why so many people who know and understand who the Teen Titans are as characters are predispositioned to dislike the show. For them, the frame of reference is simply too strong to look past. 
It doesn't matter if the core concept is good or if the comedic fundamentals are solid. Once a distinction has been made that these characters are acting out of character, an audience connection is nearly impossible to make. This is why the reactionary backlash from the creators of this series from the negative reception is simultaneously foolish and unfair. It's foolish in that to passive-aggressively refer to everyone who criticizes their show as haters is dismissive of any legitimate complaints they might receive. It's unfair in that the show was basically kneecapped from its conception. The decision to take these established characters and force them into situations most anyone with a frame of reference would understand is not appropriate for them isn't a wise one, no matter what approach you take. Though, much like the bullied kid who doubles down on their behavior because it's their only defense mechanism from the bullying, the series creators have been forced into a corner by people unwilling to give it any leeway, and they lash out with a self-deprecating attitude to their own disdain and the broad strokes response to any and all criticism they receive. However, in this situation, there's no happy compromise. The only way for people to give this series any realistic chance of being enjoyed fully is to remove the frame of direct reference, which unfortunately isn't a realistic expectation. And thus the series will live on the best it can, trapped in an inescapable representational prison like a solid tree sown in salted earth. It's unfortunate that a series can be struck with such a fatal flaw before it even gets a chance to prove itself. The inextricable association it receives, beyond any attachments of nostalgia or opinion, drastically overshadows what is, ultimately, an often amusing and harmless show. The only true harm it inflicts is upon its own characters, but that isn't something that can be fixed by a simple change of script or director. It'd be churlish of me to say that this series is rotten to the core, because there is a lot more going on with this series than you may think. Whether or not what is going on is to your tastes, though, in the end, is a matter of opinion. It's unreasonable to ask those who understand these once deep and impactful characters to simply look past the changes and enjoy themselves. However, it's also unreasonable to see those who do enjoy it as idiotic or childish. In reality, I sincerely hope that this polarizing entity, while flawed in an irreparable way, can find its own success without pretending to be something it isn't, or forcing itself down people's throats with aggressive scheduling or overt acknowledgement of its own disdainful audience. In reconciling the show's existence, we need to remember that the past is the past, and we should never use the past to condemn the future. We'll never lose what was once special to us, but we can allow something new into our hearts, even if it isn't the same as what we once knew. For some people, it's impossible. To those with a strong frame of reference, it's unreasonable to ask them to change their minds. What is needed isn't for anyone to change their minds. Ultimately, what is needed is understanding. And understanding that just because something isn't the same as what we had, or doesn't appeal to us, doesn't mean it's worthless. If we can respect the differences between what once was and what now is, and recognize the merit in both, then maybe, someday, we can all reach a happy compromise. <laughs>